Um, welcome to History Matters and So Does Coffee. Um, today, as previously advertised, as ever, like 12 hours in advance, we're going to be talking about American exceptionalism. Actually, Jessica, I'm going to ask you to mute. I will do that. Excellent. Okay. Um, we're going to be talking about um, American exceptionalism uh, for a variety of reasons, which I will explain um, in a moment. Um, Jessica will be back in a moment. Um, so she, for today, she is at the National Council for Social Studies. Is that correct? Uh, she is my partner in crime for the day since Annie and Carolee are presenting at this conference. And we are out on the conference um, what do they call it there? It's the book room at history conferences. It's the it's the exhibit floor. Exhibit floor. We are on the exhibit floor. So um, we're on display and thank heavens that, that you found a way to hide the background because uh, when we were here a moment ago, people were walking by and looking and it would be very hard for me to concentrate if, <laughs> if that was still happening. But Jessica, why don't you offer us uh, the rules of the game? Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I feel like a sports announcer. Good morning, everyone. I'm calling in live from the NCSS exhibit floor. I'm really excited to be co-hosting today with Joanne. Welcome to anybody who is new to this wonderful community. Here's how this is going to work. I'm going to turn off my camera in a minute. Joanne is going to talk for 30 minutes about the topic of the day. Please put your questions in the Q&A, not in the chat, in the Q&A. And then in a half an hour, I will turn my camera back on and I will read out the questions in the Q&A to Joanne and we'll have a conversation. And then at the hour, we will turn off Facebook and turn off recording and go into the after party, which we will talk about later. So Joanne, welcome. Good morning. Hello to everybody in the community. Get out your bingo card, share the bingo card again, everyone, and let's have a good conversation. Wonderful. Thank you, Jessica. Okay. Um, and as ever, um, I will say that uh, as Tom Mackey just demonstrated, if you are new to the History Matters community, which is really, really a community, I believe this is the 100, Carolee is not here, I believe it's the 192nd straight episode, folks. Um, so if you are new to this community, which is a community, please introduce yourself. I see a thumb, a little thumb up floating up the screen. Okay, I got the number right. Um, if you are new or if you are here live for the first time, please introduce yourself and you will get a robust welcome from the wonderful History Matters community. Um, okay, so um, American exceptionalism. So the reason why I chose this for today in part has to do with what I saw floating around online, I guess in the last day or two. Um, apparently, uh, and I only read it this morning, I got I got lost in reading this morning and I'll explain why a little bit later. But at any rate, um, Robert Kagan wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post on um, how, basically how it's quite possible that we could move our way right into a dictatorship. Very blunt very scary, um, worth reading, maybe not first thing in the morning before a bracing cup of coffee, but um, that prompted a conversation, uh, not surprisingly. And um, Jamel Bowie, um, get his quote here, um, who always has smart things to say, um, said this, um, I continue to think that Trump's great advantage is the entrenched American belief that it can't happen here. Now, um, I actually, I'm going to read one other thing he uh, said only because it's sort of perfect for our community where um, almost every week I've probably talked about contingency. Uh, he said, for all of the pessimism about the present, many Americans basically believe that we exist outside of contingent history uh, and that nothing could possibly get worse than the present, but uh, that's not the case. Now, I'm not meaning to start out here by saying we're all going down. Uh, as you'll see, the point that I'm going to be making is <laughs> we may, we may not, but the we may part of that equation is vitally important to be not just aware of, but to accept. And I'll explain that throughout the episode. But it was that, it was his comments and the op-ed and the response that led to um, 
my wanting to have this conversation today. Now, I went back because as soon as I saw that comment, and I think I saw it really early in the morning because I always do the unwise thing of waking up and being like, I wonder what's happening. And that's often not a good thing to do. In this case, I saw that American exceptionalism was being discussed. And I think I even immediately broadcast out, this might be on Blue Sky, broadcast out the fact, I was like, I've been talking about this for years. And then I went back to, oops, the former Twitter, uh, to look and see. And indeed, I think I started talking about it in 2018. Um, I stopped counting. I found like 15 maybe different instances where I'm like, but, but, but American exceptionalism, we shouldn't believe in American exceptionalism. Again and again and again and again and again. I found um, an article I wrote in The Atlantic about this. I found an interview I did on the Belchie show on MSNBC about this. I've been talking about this a lot. But lo and behold, interestingly, when I went back to look at past episodes of the 191 Before This Moment episodes, early on, I did an episode on um, It Can't Happen Here that touched on the idea of excep exceptionalism, but didn't really delve into it or talk about it much. And so to my delight, because <laughs> my great fear is that I come up with a great idea, I'm excited to talk about it, then it's like, yes, I have committed two episodes in the past to it. This is not the case. So at any rate, long background into how we came to be talking about this topic today. The idea that somehow or other, um, America is so exceptional as a nation that the rules of the rest of the world don't apply here, that horrible bad things can't happen here, that no matter what happens, it will all be okay in the end. And what I tweeted, posted, fill in the weird social media verb that you choose over and over and over again was, some version of um, American exceptionalism, our absolute faith in American exceptionalism is blinding us to what's happening right in front of our face. Now, I began saying that I think in 2018, it is, remains true that somehow or other, no matter what's happening, and no matter what's happening, not just here, but around the world, it's bred into us in some way, right? This is, it, it's in our, it feels as though it's in our blood, this idea that, well, America is exceptional in every way. And so whatever holds true to the rest of the world or what even seems likely to be holding true now, it won't happen. We've survived everything. It's all gonna be okay. We are exceptional. So rules don't apply to us. It will all be okay. Um, And that's, you know, um, we are exceptional in many ways. Every country is exceptional in some ways. Um, but the idea that we somehow exist outside of time and space and that everything will always be okay here, it's a wrong idea. Um, it's a bad idea. And it can be, as I'll be talking about today, a dangerous idea because it can blind us to very real risks that can have a very concrete outcome that we might not appreciate, see, or understand the seriousness of if we're that programmed to assume that we will all be okay, we will always be okay because we are the United States of America. So that's the idea. Now, when I sat down this morning and began to think about this topic, um, you know, one thing I thought to myself it was, well, this goes all the way back, right? Let's, let me think about this idea of American exceptionalism and how far back it goes. Now, obviously, the first thing that popped into my head without thinking very much uh, was the John Winthrop, Puritan John Winthrop uh, in Massachusetts Bay, um, giving his sermon, A Model of Christian Charity, in which he talked about, you know, we shall be as a city upon a hill. Uh, so I thought, there you go. You know, you can go all the way back and see the city upon a hill. But guess what? Um, when you delve into that, and I this is what I re referred to a moment ago. I, I found a book that I began delving into this morning and then I actually was starting to read it. And then I realized I had 15 minutes to get my act together and be here for you. Um, the book is titled, and I know Tim is gonna be like in a nanosecond. The book is titled City on a Hill, A History of American Exceptionalism by Abram Van Engen, E-N-G-E-N. -E really interesting. Um, and one of the things it points out and that others point out as well, um, is that the idea of city on a hill, as Winthrop describes it, really didn't become big in American usage and particularly political usage until the 1960s. So this is not as though, you know, as, as my sort of 
pre-coffee brain thought, like, oh, we've always been thinking of ourselves as a city on a hill. Well, we're going to complicate that a little bit this morning, but that phrase, city on a hill, as a 20th century phenomenon as far as being really powerful in American rhetoric, number one. Number two, it we always refer to that statement, think of that statement as the way I started out by describing it, right? We shall be an example for the world. This is America, or in this case, Massachusetts Bay. We shall be exceptional. But um, that phrase comes from, and let's see if I have it here, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, in which Jesus warns, a city on a hill cannot be hid. What Jesus apparently is saying, and I am no expert on biblical interpretation, so I am taking this based on what I read this morning, but apparently um, he's warning, if a city on a hill, if you're up there on that hill, the eyes of the world will be on you. And you will not be able to hide your failures. You will not be able to hide the fact that you do not live up to what you should be. That's a far more complicated message than we shall be as a city on a hill, right? That's saying, okay, you're going to be out there. People are going to be watching you. You better take care because you might not live up to what you're setting yourself up to be. That's a warning. That's not self-praise. That's a warning. So first off, right off the bat, if you're thinking about this idea of American exceptionalism, we are the city on a hill or the equivalent, well, even that simple starting point in and of itself is not that simple. Now, it is true that uh, move ahead in time to a period that I'm more familiar with, right, the founding period. And indeed, there's a lot of discussion about how what's going on uh, in first the colonies, but really the new United States uh, is something new, right? We're in a new world. It's a new world order. The old world is corrupt. The old world is rotten. It's it's sort of dying out in its rottenness, but the new world, the new world will be something different. It will be purer. Um, American government, small r, Republican government will be something that in a sense is, is more virtuous and is um, grounded on responsibility and in some ways a sense of morality, um, not necessarily religion, but morality. Um, anyway, in one way or another, it is very true that the founding generation, uh, so in that sense, from the state-defined beginning of the United States, there was a sense that what was happening in the United States was different and better and would spread around the world. So, for example, when the French Revolution is uh, gets underway in the late 17, mid and late 1790s, you have people like Thomas Jefferson and others who believe this is the start, like the spark of liberty that was lit in the United States. And there it is, it's spreading around the world. It's gotten to France. Look at this, we are changing the world. And this is part of that saying, we are different. We play by different rules. We are um, creating something new and wonderful that the rest of the world hasn't seen and it will spread and we will change the world. That is indeed an idea that goes all the way back as does the related idea that providence has in one way or another set us up to be that special world. And that tends to be the phrase that appears a lot, right? It's providential, it's providence. That in one way or another, this is this, this will happen this way. It's meant to happen this way. So in that sense, it does go back to the beginning. But here's kind of in the same way that the Winthrop comment is complicated. Here's the flip side of this faith in the founding period that um, we are special and different. We are a new world in a very literal way. And I've talked about this countless times here on History Matters. Um, and that is the idea that it can all go down in flames very quickly, right? This idea, the instability, the sense of, I say this all the time. I know, I know there are people in the exhibit on the exhibit floor at the National Council for Social Studies Conference who may be watching. So I must say to them, I probably have discussed contingency a hundred million zillion times every episode. And so, which is why I laugh every time I say contingency um, in and of itself, it's not necessarily funny, but um, this extreme sense of contingency in the founding era, that one stupid mistake, one bad choice 
could send it all down. It could collapse. On the one hand, they are thinking that the what becomes the United States is an example for the world, that we are special, we are exceptional. And on the other hand, they also believe it could go down in moments. It's fragile. It may not survive. It's experimental. And it has to be carefully guarded, watched. It's that second half of the equation that explains why the founding generation and the immediate generations after that were very focused on education. But again, particularly at the beginning when people understand that they're setting precedents in a, in a very concrete, real way, that the focus on education was in part because to understand risks to the new experimental American Republic, you had to be educated to recognize those risks. You had to be educated enough to know, among other things, history, because history teaches what happened to republics in the past. History teaches what to watch out for. So history, if you educate people, and particularly if they learn, among other things, history, they will be able to watch out for the kinds of threats that might destroy the new experimental American republic. So right there, although there is from the beginning this sense of us being special and exceptional and, and new, we have new rules. At the very same time, there is a profound, not just understanding, but assumption that it's fragile, that it can collapse, that it needs to be protected, that it isn't set in stone that the United States and what people thought to be exceptional about it will survive. Now, move a little bit ahead in time uh, and look at the early 19th century um, leading up to the Civil War. And interestingly, uh, at, you, we now, um, as, as it would say in Hollywood, right, the nation's now got legs, right? It, it survived a little bit. It's not the first 10 years where we've now existed a little bit. And let's say we got through the War of 1812, which for some people was very exciting because it meant that we went up against uh, Britain a second time and they didn't crush us. So woohoo, look at us, right? This is very exciting. But we're, we're moving ahead. We have not gotten to the Civil War yet. We're looking at those decades. And what are people saying in those decades at the same time that they're still thinking like we're special, we're different, we're a different kind of nation. And I wonder if there's going to be disunion. There's a book by Elizabeth Varon with the appropriate title, Disunion, I think, let me look here. It has an exclamation point, disunion. Um, really interesting book because one of the things that it does is track ideas about disunion and how it's used politically over time. And she shows how again and again and again, not always with the same sense of conviction and belief, but still the idea that there might be disunion, the union might collapse, the United States might no longer exist that that idea is used again and again and again and again and again, sometimes really just in a way to um, be rhetorical and to scare people, uh, sometimes in a way that actually is meant to get people thinking eventually in a way that has a grounding in reality. But the idea that whatever we consider to be, you know, the exceptional, different, unique American nation might shatter, that's a part of everyday dialogue in one sense, political rhetoric for a very long time. Um, and again, and we can talk about this during the Q&A, the degree to which we're talking about rhetoric versus belief um, and, and political usefulness of a phrase versus what people sincerely believe. But certainly when you look at um, the, the sort of guide slash narrator of my, my last book, The Field of Blood, his name is Benjamin Brown French, um, and he's a clerk in the House of Representatives, and he has this amazing diary that I milked for all it was worth uh, because he his job was to watch Congress, uh, which was wonderful, but he reflected on everything. And one of the things you see in his diary, and it begins, I believe, in the 1830s, I mean, not the diary, but his fears in the late 1830s, um, is this idea that it all may, everything may collapse. Um, and for example, every time uh, that he, it appears to be impossible to choose a Speaker of the House, uh, he will say in his diary, maybe this is the time. Like maybe, maybe it's done. Maybe I am 
can't remember. I'm not going to do justice to his phrase, like walking behind the, wait, I did not shut off my phone and now it's like dinging over here. I am the bad student. Um, at any rate, um, maybe I am watching the death of my country is not how he puts it, but that's what he's saying in his diary. Maybe this is it. Maybe this is the moment when we go down. So as I sat this morning um, and began to think about how I was going to talk about exceptionalism, and I thought, oh yeah, it goes all the way back. And then I realized, no, but actually, if you go all the way back, there's the assumption, the knowledge, the fear in a very real way that it won't survive, that however special it is, it's not um, inevitable that it will survive. It's not something that, you know, no matter what, we will be here, it might go down. Now, interestingly, we, at least until the semi-recent past, we kind of lost part of that equation. And I, I did not this morning try and think when we, that, that, you know, we started to think that, yeah, we're here and that the sort of, uh-oh, it may all go down uh, aspect of that, that formula, that equation went away. Um, and I, you know, we can discuss that. Um, but at some point we began to take survival and even after a certain point of the early 20th century, prosperity somewhat for granted, right? That it can't happen here as I've talked about before, as many have said and are still saying now when they're discussing the current state of our politics, it can't happen here, we're fine. Democracy is democracy, democracy will survive. Um, even as we sit here and talk about this, I sometimes feel that the idea of American exceptionalism is so bred into our bones that even as we consciously sit here and talk about the fact that we can't have faith in it, some part of ourselves still believes that. That it's so much a part, or certainly when I look back at um, my being in school, you know, and, and sort of what I absorbed or inhaled over the course of just basic public school learning and American culture generally, you know, that was part of what I was inhaling and assuming is you know, of course, you know, like we're special when we go on and that's that's who we are. And even if my intellect tells me we can't assume that, there's some little, you know, tiny voice somewhere in me that's like, but we're special and it'll be okay, right? That's hard to take out. That's, that's something that is so in our bones that I think um, it's the default. And I, I it should not be the default. Um, now, I'm not saying... Uh, as I kind of started out by suggesting um, that what we should be doing is predicting or anticipating doom at any second. Um, as I've, again, I, I now feel like I should just like have, as I've said before, like just up on the screen. So whatever I say, because after 192 episodes, <laughs> we've, we've said a lot of things. Um, but at any rate, um, as I've said before, I I do sincerely believe that we are we are on a ledge of a sort. There is a very real danger ahead of us. We need to be aware of it. We need to understand what's happening right in front of us, that there is a very real risk that democracy, as we understand it and as we have taken it for granted, may not exist within a year, two years. Now, at the same time that I fundamentally believe that to be true, I also believe, and this has to do with contingency, we don't know what's coming. We can't predict that. We live, as everyone does, in a state of contingency. We don't know what comes next. Bad things might happen. They might not happen. They might not happen. We don't know what comes next. What that means is we have to be aware that this idea of, you know, we're indestructible, that uh, the United States will always be okay. If you believe that, not only are you going to not necessarily see and prepare for whatever may be happening, but you're not going to do what you can do right now in the present to push that away, to, to fight against that, to recognize the threat and fend it off. So it's vitally important to move past the idea of American exceptionalism, not only because we like need to understand that bad things might happen, but because we can be doing things, should be doing things in the moment 
as we recognize the threat, we should be seeing the threat. We should be talking about it. We should be pointing it out. We should be seeing things that happen that are profoundly wrong and not just sort of going, huh, well, that's an unfortunate trend. We should be pointing them out, talking to people, talking to our representatives locally, nationally, getting together, organizing, acting, being loud, taking up air. Right? We should be in this moment communicating to people. There's a very, very real risk that bad things can happen. And we cannot assume it will all be okay. Now, given what I just said, that we all, you know, even as I sit here, I'm sure there's some little voice in my head that's like, but, but, but maybe it will all be okay. It'll all be okay. We might have to yell pretty loudly <laughs> to get this message across, right? I mean, because we here, we've been meeting here and talking, um, having what I always call the conversation of democracy for years. We're primed to think about these things, uh, to question things, to wonder about the survival of things, to confront um, what we're facing at the moment and what we can do about it. Many, many people are not in that state of mind. They are not thinking that way, and which is part of why we need to speak up, not scream and howl, you know, but speak up and make it clear what this moment requires, awareness, alertness, um, a voice, giving voice to what you think, um, getting others to engage in the conversation of democracy so that they do this same kind of work. It requires work in this moment. And no one will do this kind of work if they assume it's always going to be fine, it's all okay, America is exceptional, so, of course, democracy will survive. You know, we think of American exceptionalism to such a degree that even though we see in other countries around the world far-right extremists gaining power, even then we're like, well, yeah, but that's the rest of the world. And maybe we're having that moment here, um, but it'll pass and, you know, dot, 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 fill in the, the blanks. The degree to which somehow people think that whatever they're seeing now um, there will be an election and it will fix things. Don't count on anything, truly. Have your have your radar up. Um, be aware of what's going on, point it out. Find patterns, be historians of the present. Find patterns in what's going on around you so that you understand, you can see what's happening. You can ask about it. You can talk to people about it. Don't take anything for granted in this moment. We live in a state of extreme contingency. In a sense, for 192 weeks, I have been priming us for this message. We live in a state of extreme contingency. We always live in a state of contingency. We never know precisely what's going to come. But this current moment with some um, basic frameworks of democracy really under threat, we live in a state of extreme contingency. And that means we have to be that much more aware, that much louder, that much more willing to do some work to stand up for what we can no longer take for granted. I'm, I've now, I'm, I'm, I'm in full soapbox mode at this point. And I have had some coffee, so maybe that's helping. At any rate, the reason why I wanted to have this conversation today is, is in a sense because of all of that, because the article, the op-ed in the Washington Post, and then the conversation that was unfolding, I believe it was mostly on Blue Sky. And then my awareness when I went back to Twitter that, wow, 2018, I was yelling about this, like, yo. And that 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 tweet, I think it, it for that, in that point of time, and I had many less followers, I think, um, that sort of went viral in its way. And I remember thinking, okay, like some other people see what I'm talking about because what I'm talking about is important. I want to emphasize that point now. I'm, this is not going to be the last time I talk about this. And that's, you know, surprise, I'm going to be talking about it in different ways at other moments. But it's important to get past American exceptionalism. Going back to the founding period, you know, I, I have notes here and it says, well, what did that awareness of our ability to collapse as a nation, what did that give people? Um, and what I scribbled down here in my notes, I wrote, well, it didn't prevent corruption in politics. It didn't prevent stupid mistakes. 
but it did make people aware. It did make people take care. It did make them consider possibilities. They didn't always make the right choices about those possibilities. But that idea that we're not sort of inevitably okay, that created an important awareness, an awareness of a sort that we have to have now. So um, don't take democracy for granted. Don't take the rule of law for granted. Don't take your rights of protest and free speech for granted. Don't take freedom of religion for granted. And don't take the long arc of justice for granted that in the end, justice will prevail. Don't take things for granted. Sit up, watch what's happening, speak up and speak with others. Be in the moment, be in this moment rather than assuming a good future exist in the moment as it is and try to be aware of and think of the most productive, useful things you can do in this moment to defend American democracy. That is the work we should all be doing now. Okay, I've gone a little bit over and I'm going to stop. I'm going to get like unsoapbox myself. Um, I Mug, mug, mug. So so Carolee is, is not here. Carolee sent on some form of social media, something saying in advance, mug, mug, mug. Um, for for any for anyone, I'm gonna make this big again. For anyone um, who is watching from the exhibit hall, as luck might have it, um, for 191 previous weeks, um, I have had a mug that, in one way or another, touches on the theme of what we're talking about. I think this is a Carolee mug. Um, and so if it isn't, then someone's going to have to step forward and claim this mug. Um, but I believe it is a, a Carely mug. Um, and it has actually, well, I'm going to start with one side because the other side actually, this tell, it's not a new mug. The other side has a tweet on it. And anyway, the, the front side, which does not have a tweet on it, says, history should make you uncomfortable. Ask questions, challenge assumptions. Think this is the, the mug of today, right? Like what I just said is not all smooth, happy, like, ah, everything is okay. As much as I'd like to do that, um, this is the mood of, of what I've just said. It does um, have a version of it. It started out as a tweet. I have no idea when I made that tweet, but at any rate, this is the mug, the mug of the day. Okay. Um, yes. I will now open chat. Here we and go. And we've got a lot of great questions, Joanne. I moved to what was hopefully a quieter spot uh, in the convention I will say center. before you start, I want to say to Dave, Dave says act rather than think both. <laughs> both, but you're right. Act. Act is important. Yes. Yeah. We can think about stuff, but we also have to jump into the arena where we're needed and where, are, what, what are our skills? How can we use our skills to stand up? So, all right, we've got a lot of great questions. Um, Joanne, I'm gonna start with the more historical one. Mm -hmm. So um, Mona says, I've heard you refer to the American experiment many times. And you said that the founders knew that what they created was not perfect. Did any of the founders think that the experiment was failing? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um... Alexander Hamilton actually thought it would fail, um, which is, you know, the Hamilton that we get from the Broadway musical would not think that. Um, at, at some point uh, in the last, I don't know, five, seven years, I gave a lecture, I think at Columbia, um, in which, and, and I, it's actually the first episode of History Matters used a document that I used to make this point. It's a memo that Hamilton writes to himself after the Constitutional Convention. I did it, I, I sat at my desk back there with my hair like all up messy and I did it like a rough version of what I thought History Matters could be with that document. And then I sent it into NCHE and I was like, you guys think we could do something like this? Anyway, that was that was this document. Yes, we can. <laughs> I guess so. But what, what's noteworthy about the document is um, it's, it's like 10 days after the Constitutional Convention and Hamilton for just for himself says essentially, what do I think is gonna happen next? And he has different possible outcomes and what's going to happen. And he essentially says, well, 
Maybe George Washington will be president. Good bet that that's going to happen. That would be good. People trust Washington. They will trust the people Washington puts in office, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he goes on. He says, but, you know, I don't know. Maybe that won't happen. Uh, maybe he won't become president or, or maybe things will go in a worse direction. In which case, I don't know, probably states would turn against each other rather than hang together. Why would they? Or, or foreign nations would come in, sweep in and begin to cherry pick parts of the United States and take them, or there would be some kind of civil war, or there would be some kind of, at any rate, he has this sort of apocalyptic vision of things that might happen. And the kicker, and this is why I always use this document as a way to show contingency, at the very end, he says something like, that's the most likely outcome. Okay, this is 10 days after the Constitutional Convention. And Hamilton basically says, I don't think this is gonna work. I really don't. When you look through his writings over time, uh, and I guess I should probably make this an article, um, he doesn't necessarily say it's going down, but he says or implies over and over again, I don't know, folks, I'm not sure. I think it's not gonna work, but I'm gonna be here for it while it's here, is essentially what he says. And the last statement he writes, um, right before the duel, uh, he writes this, you know, why I am fighting this duel kind of statement in case he dies. Uh, and the last paragraph of that statement written just in general, again, not to a specific person, he says something along the lines of some, some of you out there may be wondering why I'm doing this. Uh, and let me explain to you why I'm doing this. Uh, and again, a bad paraphrase. He says something like, in those crises of public affairs, which seem likely to happen, that's actually probably a direct quote. <laughs> In those crises of public affairs, which seem likely to happen, so, so basically when things get bad here, as they will, you're going to need leaders to step up and be there to fight. And I want to be one of those people. And if I don't defend my honor, I can't be. And that's why I'm doing this. His last statement is, it's going to go bad. It's going to go bad. And I want to be here, you know, being useful when it does. So there's someone who, like everybody else, considered it an experiment. And they meant that in a real, real way. Like, we haven't had a, a republic of this kind in the modern world. Huh. The rest of the world is monarchies. I wonder if this can actually work. And Hamilton kind of said, well, I'm not sure. He's the guy who said the best government, on the finest government on the face of the earth is the British government. You know, that's basically what he thought. And he did indeed try to push the United States government as close towards that as he could get it. So the, that's a really long answer to the question. Yeah, <laughs> some people didn't think it would succeed. A lot of people thought um, that it might, that it could. Um, what's interesting is um, at some point, and I'm, I'm probably in one, my lecture course, maybe not my American Revolution, but maybe my early national America lecture course, I talk about like how pessimistic were the people who were alive, the founder folk uh, who were still alive and when they died, what were they thinking? And some of them are optimistic. Some of them are really not optimistic uh, about what's coming next. So they, it was a mixed bag, I would say, as to um, even moving ahead into part of the 19th century, um, whether people thought that this would actually work or not. And we are still figuring it out. And we are to this very minute, 1042, <laughs> still figuring it out. Um, we've got two questions that are pretty similar. So I'm going to combine them from Dave and Bailey asking about if you're, if you don't accept that America is exceptional, are you un-American and not patriotic? Or if Americans don't see themselves as exceptional, do they forfeit the right to the name American? Ooh, okay, good question. That's a really good question because, you know, I would say um, I believe that the United States, um, I love the United States as a nation. I believe there are things about it that are special, right? That should be, I believe it's a nation of promise. I believe it's a nation for many people of opportunity, but I believe it's a nation of promise. So I can sit here and say to you, I'm profoundly patriotic about my country. I want the best for my country. I think it has the potential to be fair and um, more just 
than it has been in the past and that some other countries are now. I don't think that that acknowledging that the country isn't this exceptional, you know, man of steel kind of country, I don't think that that means you can't be patriotic. I think it means you can be patriotic and, and realistic at the same time. That I guess is part of what I'm saying. I feel that I'm realistic about the country and for all the reasons that I value it and love it and think that it is distinctive from some other countries, I do not think it's infallible. I do not think that it's always right. And to believe that the country is infallible, that the country is always right, that the country has done no wrong, is to do an injustice to the United States. You can't understand where we are if you don't understand the reality of the past, including all of the ugliness. And if you can't or won't see that ugliness, not only will you not understand where we are in present, but you're just closing your eyes to a big part of American history. You're, you're refusing to see your nation for what it is. I mean, you know, this is obvious, but the people we love in our lives, we love them and we definitely know their flaws, right? I mean, you know, I, I, I love friends and family. I, I profoundly love friends and family. Doesn't mean I don't know their flaws, right? Of course I do. And the times they've done things that made me mad and the things that I could predict they're going to do probably again that'll make me mad. And that's okay. And I still, I, I love them for who they are. I know the things about them that I admire and respect. It's not mutually exclusive here. And I think it's very um, naive to assume that you can only love your country and what, and you cannot have of any feeling more complicated than that. And if you do anything other than just blindly love your country without anything questioning or complicating that love, then you're unpatriotic, you're un-American. I, I, that makes no sense to me at all. Um, I think to really love your country, you need to love it in its entirety uh, in, for its good and its bad. And that's the only way it can become better. Yeah, I use that analogy a lot, Joanne, when I'm talking about this topic. It's like, I love my kids. I understand that my kids are not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everyone, everyone watching this is yeah. could, could say, if we had like a microphone, we're like, okay, they would all be like, oh, I love, I love so-and-so, but they do the stupidest things, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Oh. Uh, we have a question from Greg. How much is the conviction in U.S. exceptionalism related to a belief in divine entitlement to a promised land? Indeed. Um, well, you know, I, I mentioned the word providence at the outcome, right? So they, the divine providence is a phrase they would have used at the time. Um, and there certainly would have been a general sense, uh, and I'm not... I'm really, really, really not saying that the founding generation wanted this to be um, a Christian nation and have a national religion that it's more, surprise, it's more complicated than that. But, um, you know, I suppose if you say divine providence, well, again, they did in the founding period, as I just said, they talked about divine providence all the time, right? In every possible way, like, uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson die on the same day in 1824. Divine providence, right? They they said that all the time. And they did. You look that up and look for the word providence or providential and you will find this. Um, you can believe that and still think bad things are going to happen. It's all going to hell in a handbasket. Like it, we're not talking mutually exclusive. And we really want a, a mutually exclusive world where good is good and exceptional is exceptional. And we can just think that and believe that. Um, and, and this is the most obvious thing in the world to say, but it doesn't work that way, right? That's like, um, I've talked before about uh, John Adams in his senior years when, you know, all of the founding folk who lived to be really old uh, had random strangers writing to them, asking them questions about the founding. And they spent a lot of time answering these random letters from strangers. I, I can give you, um, I know I've given it to you before. I'll give it to you again because I love it. Um, Thomas Jefferson hated this. I mean, like, hated it because he spent so much time answering these stupid letters. <laughs> stupid, they were sincere, but he was like, really? And so he, 
at some point says he's describing how he gets up really early and he begins to you know answer these letters and talk to people about the founding and et cetera et cetera et cetera and he's he's so tired of it he can't stand it and this is a direct Jefferson quote quote is this life <laughs> just love that <laughs> so you know they answered these questions all the time and what they said and particularly John Adams John Adams said this again and again and again we didn't know what the heck we were doing. We didn't know what we were doing. And we did stupid things. We did so many stupid things. I mean, one of my favorite versions of that, you know, he says in one letter, I sat there and watched people sign the Declaration of Independence. I saw them sign it. There were a lot of people that were not happy to be signing that document. We did not all like line up and like, yes, sir, independence. Right? He's like, we didn't know what we were doing. And a lot of us didn't like what we did and we made mistakes. There's one letter where he's like, we made mistakes in 1777, 78, 79, 80. Yeah, we got the point, John, 81. You know, he's, his his point really is we didn't know what we were doing. We, it, it could absolutely, we thought it could fail at any moment. We don't know. Um, and as John Adams, the reason he said this over and over again was you have to understand that. You can't think that we were these golden founders who set this thing in motion and it's perfect. You cannot think that. What, whatever they put in motion in the founding period, they assumed it would require work to continue. And so for us to be like, yep, it's all okay. I'll just you know go and vote and go back home and not think about it again. Um, that is not something they would have assumed how the system would work back in that founding period is this life feels like it should be a t-shirt or a or mug. Uh, what should be a t-shirt for a mug? Is this, oh, life? Is this life? Yes. <laughs> I just walk I walk around that. like that all day. Is this life? Is I this know. life? What's happening I, here? I know. I, I'll, have to, I'll have to find it. Um, I once said it giving a lecture um, at Monticello. Now that's gutsy, right? Is this life? <laughs> I, and I and I believe even there they they laugh. But I I will go find it. It, yeah. it is a favorite. And you can say to quote Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> "Is this life?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it! I love it. <laughs> so we've got a question from George: Is nationalism and American exceptionalism the same thing? I don't think so. They don't have to be. Um, and it depends on how you define nationalism. Um, nationalism, um, if you if you mean nationalism as, you know, my country, right or wrong, I suppose that's related. Um, so I, I guess I, I can't absolutely answer that because I'm not sure how you're defining nationalism. If by nationalism, you mean um, thinking only of the nation, so you you tell me what you mean by that if you want, and we can go further. But I, I can't, it can mean a lot of different things, right? Nationalism. Um, but if it does mean my country first, my country right or wrong, that's a close relative to, you know, my country is exceptional and will not fall prey to anything that the rest of the world has to be wary about. Uh, we've got a question from Dale. And Dale, uh, help me if I'm getting this wrong. So he says... Given the decline of teaching in history in schools, how would you suggest teaching American exceptionalism in schools? And at what level would it be appropriate? Really good question. And of course, I'm saying this to a whole bunch of teachers, so you guys might have better answers than I do. But um, I don't think it's problematic to teach people that the nation was founded by people who were figuring it out as they went. You know, that in other words... Um, they were trying to do something new and good and they made some good choices and they made some bad choices and they assumed that in the future people would have to think and act and make they would make good choices and make bad choices and that if we're responsible good Americans we have to think about the choices we make I don't know you know I I, I think you can teach and you guys tell me actually um, I think you can teach that there are things about this country that we love that are special, not necessarily unique, but that are special, but that they don't always work the way some of us might want them to work and that we always have to work at preserving them and making them better. That nothing is perfect and our country isn't perfect and it could be a lot better, but there are many things about it that are good. 
and that are valuable. You know, even if you go back to the founding and you look at the ideas and ideals that some of the founding generation had, did they intend them to be as sweeping and broad uh, as we would love them to be? No way, right? I mean, no, they didn't at all. And they would be horrified, uh, even at some of the things we see as, as positive reform would have horrified them. But does that mean that nothing, that the fact that those ideals existed doesn't count? No, if they released ideas that others, future generations could see and, and grab at and use as tools to better themselves and better the nation, that counts, that matters, right? So um, I don't, you know, the, the founders um, came up with ideas that people afterwards, um, enslaved Americans, women, you know, many, many, many others said, hey, you know, <laughs> you guys said this, you put it in your documents, well, guess what? You know, we're here, um, that they became a ladder of sorts. That's finally important. And that can be true. Uh, and that can be part of the promise and the goodness of the United States. And we can still say the people who created those ideals really problematic in a whole bunch of ways and did not live up to what we now understand those ideals to be. They did not mean to, and they did not live up to those ideals as we see them, as we want them to be. They didn't. Well, and, and that's that's a really great point. And I think that as social studies, especially in elementary years, is just shrinking, 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 mm -hmm. we, we can bring these concepts in with our littlest learners because you can bet kindergartners understand rules and fairness and mm -hmm. things like that. So how do we use those as building blocks to get to, you know, what you're talking about here? So um, we've got so many good questions, Joanne. So I'm going to try to get in at least one more before we get into the after party. And I don't know if you saw in the chat that Sandra Day O'Connor just passed away. Oh, oh, that's so sad. I did not see that. I'm so sorry to hear that. She is 93 and it the news dropped as soon as we were starting here. And yeah. so as I'm walking around the exhibit hall and seeing iCivics and so many organizations that were inspired by her yeah um it's a really difficult day losing two women incredible women with Rosalind Carter passing away right. recently right. um and so wow. Mir Miranda has a question about that is that what does it mean for us that Sandra Day O'Connor just passed away with her and RBG gone the OGs as she calls them are no longer to help guide us here to help guide us yeah um I mean, what does it mean? In a sense, the question was answered, right? That there there are people who um, are vital, were vital in the ways that they could guide us, whether by their example or by their words or by their actions. Um, you know, I suppose I, I don't have the absolute answer to that, except to say that um, their passage is a reminder of precisely what we've been talking about this morning, right? Here are these people who represented, these women who represented something, who stood up for many things, who did that work and did that work with the, the extra difficulty of being a woman doing that work in an environment that did not want them to be there doing that work. Um, they are ex in and of themselves are examples of precisely what we're talking about and who we need to be. You know, I, their passage, I suppose, is a reminder of the fact that, um, that kind of person, that kind of effort can be fragile and needs to be continued. And can, even that can't be relied upon. That that all good things um, will not necessarily happily exist and be good things forever. And even the most admirable people, obviously none of us <laughs> will be forever. It doesn't mean that their example and their lives and their actions don't matter. But that inspiration, it should be part of what inspire us to do what I've been talking about today. Stand up, do the work. Here are women who did that precise thing. And they should be examples to us to do precisely what we've been talking about this morning. I have to I have to tell my I, I never had the honor of meeting Sandra Day O'Connor, but um, I did at one point when my first book came out. Um, someone I, it was some important event somewhere. Um, and so there were important people lurking. I don't even remember what it was. Um, but someone came up with a copy of my book for me to sign. 
and it um, said, make it out to Sandra Day O'Connor. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> So that that's my my only you know that that led me to think wow like my ideas are going to get out there look at that okay so we are we are very close let me let me then explain um, after partyness and what we're going to do now okay perfect um, so here's what's going to happen next guys um, we are now going to move into the after party what that means is we will no longer be recording this episode so that we can be even freer and easier in our conversation because we were so formal before uh, and talk about whatever we want to talk about uh, as a group. Um, if you beamed in through NCHE, just stay right where you are and poof, you will be in the after party. If you are watching us on Facebook, you need to leave Facebook to join the after party. You need to go to NCHE teach.org slash conversations. That's N-C-H-E teach.org slash conversations. And then you too, poof, will be in the after party with the rest of us. Um, while we're, we have like, I have like 60 seconds to get to the after party. Um, this gives me time to say what I say um, every week, which is um, thank you for being here to take part in the conversation of democracy. Our meeting here every week for 192 weeks and talking about the democratic process and asking questions and um, demanding questions, sometimes really demanding of me, but just generally speaking, demanding questions. Being here to have these discussions, we don't all agree all the time, but we have these discussions week after week after week. The fact that we can and that we can make those questions and that then we can leave here and have these discussions with others and do different kinds of work based on this with others. We can spread the word. All of that matters. The fact that we're here week after week matters. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming week after week to be here. Um, you are an amazing community. Um, I say that all the time. I brag about this community constantly. Like, you know, we every week this community gets together and I blather for a half hour and they ask questions for a half hour. And then we just talk about things for a half hour. Three minutes every week. And these people, these, they come, they're a community, a community of democracy. Um, at any rate, thank you for being here. Those of you who um, are here for the first time, either the first time live or the first time, first time, um, I'm glad you're here. I hope you will come back. I see maybe Kevin. Uh, Kevin maybe joined this time, Kevin, and if so, Kevin, then you have to come back now because uh, the community will go on for you. <laughs> Who's Kevin? Someone find him, bring him back. <laughs> no, but really, we hope you will come back. Um, and uh, Jessica, uh, thank you for being my partner in crime from the National National Council for Social Studies. Is that it? National? Yes, I'm at the conference in Nashville, yes. Okay, NCSS, that's, we could call it that. Um, mm -hmm. Anyone uh, out there at NCSS, if you've been watching or if you will watch during the day, if this gets replayed, you gotta join us. You just do, you can see how fun it is. So you're gonna have to join us. And Claire, uh, Claire and John, I'm sure. I, and actually, Jessica, uh, are you gonna stick around for the after party? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent, okay. Then what we are gonna do, thank you. Okay, what we're gonna do right now, <laughs> I'm like, I gotta make sure everyone's gonna be here. What we're gonna, <laughs> what yeah. we're gonna do right now. <laughs> is a segue to the after party. Again, everyone have a good week. Thank you all for being here uh, and engaging in this process that matters uh, so much to me uh, and hopefully to you too and to preserving democracy. Okay. Facebook.